Good family. Good morning, church family. How are we? Can you guys believe that December is here? 2018 is almost gone. Uh, that means that we're all getting older, right? We are all getting older. Hey, before we jump into our Bibles this morning, I want to remind you about starting point today. Immediately after we finish this service, you go out either of these double doors. We'll be in the worship center chapel. If you haven't yet had an opportunity to attend and you're just checking out Christianity or checking out this church, or you say, man, I believe God wants uh, me or my family to land here as our church and to serve and to, uh, to work together with this faith family, we would invite you to come. Next Sunday, December 9th, 5 p.m., Ocean Reef Park. What's happening? Beach baptisms, right? And uh, we're excited about that. And since we live in South Florida, we don't really fear the winter, right? Uh, actually, some of us do, right? For some of us, once it hits about 75, we're putting on our, you know, our hats and gloves and our, our ski jackets that we brought with us from New York because that's the only time we'll be able to wear them here, right, in South Florida. So uh, listen, if, you, if you've been considering following Jesus Christ as your Savior or whether you say, man, Jeff, I am in, I am ready to follow Christ, I've committed my life to him, or whether you've been a Christ follower for a long time, but you haven't yet been baptized by immersion since Jesus Christ has changed your life, we would be honored. We would love to baptize you on December 9th. So here's how you can let us know. You can take that Connect card, just put your name, contact information. You can drop that by the Next Step Center or drop it in one of these baskets here at the front after uh, we finish our service. We're going to be in Mark 10 this morning, Mark 10, and as you're finding your place there, I just want to go on record as saying I really like kids. Um, I, I do. I, I love kids, and uh, I always have. Um, I just enjoy talking to kids. I mean, you can just walk up to a group of kids, and you can ask them, what is your favorite dinosaur? And you can have a rational conversation. You do that to a group of adults, and they all walk away. Um, kids, are, I think kids are cool, but here's the thing. Not all of us feel that way. In fact, the great Christian uh, writer C.S. Lewis mentions in his basically autobiography uh, called Surprise by Joy that kids make him feel nervous. He says, children make me feel uncomfortable. I'm just not exactly sure what I'm supposed to do around kids. So here's the thing. Whether we love kids this morning, whether we're kind of like, I like kids, but I don't know what to do when they come around. For example, when you have a friend or a family member and that new baby is born into the world and they are so proud of that baby and you say, that's a baby. And they say, here, hold the baby. They hand you the baby and you hold the baby kind of out like this because you're not exactly sure what to do with the baby. Anybody in the room identify with that, right? People come and basically hand you a baby and you're like, I, 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 this is a great baby, but I don't know what to do with the baby, all right? And then there's some of us, we say, man, Jeff, even the thought of a nursery full of screaming toddlers causes me to break out into a cold sweat. Regardless of whether we have kids or what we feel about kids, this morning, we're going to focus in on how Jesus addresses Children. So we're going to talk about Jesus, kids, and Christmas this morning, and we're going to see how, regardless of whether we have kids or whether we don't or whether we're comfortable around them or we're not, we're going to see how Jesus' view on children helps shape and craft our understanding of what it means to have a relationship with God. And here today on December 2nd, we have our annual Christmas offering, a tradition where we focus on a specific ministry need, an initiative. And this year we're emphasizing a, a future children's ministry center on the campus of Grace Fellowship, that it will be dedicated to reaching kids and their families for the glory of God. And so I'm excited about that, and I would encourage you to continue to pray on what the Lord would have you to give as kind of a, a kickoff, uh, a start off of our, um, our campaign to see that building um, be raised to the glory of God. So here's the main idea that comes from Mark chapter 10. We'll read these verses in just a moment, but it's basically this, that children are precious to Jesus. So if that's the case, then children should be precious to us as well. 
Mark chapter 10, beginning in verse 13, says this. And they were bringing their children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. So parents bringing their children to Jesus to be blessed. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. So we'll look at how Jesus understands children and how that should shape our relationship with God. So notice there in verse 13, people, we could say maybe parents or guardians specifically, people were bringing their children to Jesus for Jesus to bless them. Now, regardless of what these people understood about Jesus, they knew that there was something unique about Jesus, right? Like they may not have fully understood that Jesus was the son of God, but they were thinking, man, this guy, like he treats people differently, like in a better way, like than everybody else. He teaches these things that have authority and power, and the way that he communicates is unlike anything else we've ever seen. And not only that, this guy, this prophet, or maybe he is the Messiah, is actually healing people. I want my kids to be around him. So you have parents who are bringing their children to Jesus to be blessed. Why would parents do this? Because parents then, just like parents now, we want the best for our kids, right? I mean, even if you don't have kids, you're like, man, I think we should take care of kids. We should educate them, uh, make sure that they're safe, make sure that they're loved, make sure they're cared for. Like, even if I'm not a kid person, like, I understand and I believe that, sh that, that children should be taken care of, right? That's what we all believe, regardless if we come from a faith background or not, or different religion. We'd say, man, there's something about children that should be protected and valued. And here's what I believe to be absolutely true, that, the, that Christianity, biblical New Testament Christianity, makes the best sense of the way that we all naturally feel towards children. We say, why do we feel this way? Some will give different answers. I believe that Jesus Christ provides the answer on why we believe these things about children. You know, parents then are probably not much unlike parents today to where these parents are bringing their kids to Jesus because they wanted the best for their children. Sometimes when we settle down or we have that child, and then we see the crazy world that we live in. Sometimes parents and grandparents and guardians, we can get a little worried, right? We say, man, this kid's going to grow up in this kind of a world? Like, I had challenges growing up. The world was a crazy place. But it seems, it seems to us many times that the world has gotten even crazier. And so we say, my goodness, I'm not even sure if I'm equipped to help my child or these children in my community or in my school. How do I help them? I want to bring them closer to Jesus. And what these parents were doing was exactly that. But for some of us who have had kids, we have um, seen and heard our kids say things and repeat things that they have even heard us say, and it scares us to death. Y'all okay? Okay. We see our children parrot things that they have heard in their schools and in their community and on their team. And for some of us, we say, man, I don't know exactly what my children need, but they need something. Like they need morals or they need religion. Or we may not even exactly know what, but for some of us, we've been invited to come to church. And through that, our children are ministered to. They're encouraged. They're valued. And we actually hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and we get saved. We become a genuine Christian after we understand we turn from our sins and place our faith in Jesus Christ. So this is ironic that in Jesus' day, parents were bringing their children to Jesus. But what happens many times today is our children bring us to Jesus. And that's what we pray happens more and more and more as we continue to try to reach Palm Beach County for the glory of God. You see, Jesus' heart is that the little ones, our little ones, and those in our community would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So here, here's the thing. You got parents bringing kids to Jesus, and then the disciples... They should have done something else, but they actually saw these children as an interruption. 
and the disciples rebuked them. You know what's going on? The disciples who actually knew better, they, they were reflecting the culture's view of children, which was that children are not that important. Now here at, at Grace, we have children's ministry and we have cry rooms and, uh, and we love that precious little baby that uh, is just going to greener pastures over there and hanging out. Um, but, but I know for some of us, can we speak only, so, honestly, sometimes when when kids are here in the service and they cry, some of us can look around like, oh my goodness, can you get, listen, there's a lot of churches that for years have never heard a baby cry anywhere on that property. I think every time we hear the voice of a child or an infant or even maybe sometimes at an ill-timed opportunity during a sermon, scream out and we say, my goodness, can't say. We say, praise God, we get to hear the voice of children because not only is that the next generation for church leadership, but they are here now and we have an opportunity to love them. So I'd encourage you, whether you have kids or not, if you see a lot of these, these moms or dads, whether it's mom and dad or a single mom or a single dad, just encourage them. You know, go shake their hand and give them a 20 and say, buy some diapers for the glory of God. Encourage them, amen? Because kids, it's hard, but it's absolutely worth it. So here's what happened with these disciples, right? These guys were, I mean, died in the wool, first century Palestinian Jews. Here's what that means. They knew the Bible. They knew the Bible. They knew the, the Hebrew prophets. They knew the Old Testament. They knew who Moses was. They understood that all through the Bible that it emphasized raising up your children, loving your children, pouring, pouring the word of God into your children, ch training them, not letting the baton drop. But here's what happened to the disciples. Obviously, they reflected the culture around them as opposed to changing the culture around them to be more like God. We okay, second service? And if we can be honest, that's what happens to us more often than we would care to admit. We know the word of God, but sometimes there's so many people that talk in a certain way, they have these different views that go against the word that we begin to allow those things to craft our minds as opposed to the gospel shaping our views. In the Greek and Roman world, the Greco-Roman world, uh, children were by and large, this is a long historical discussion, but children were actually not considered to be fully people or fully human. And we say, that's crazy. Listen, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, I want to suggest to you, and there is massive research to support this assertion, that the reason why we value children today is because of Jesus when Jesus does what he's about to do and is basically saying, man, bring the kids on in, what he's saying is that the big important stuff doesn't come with degrees and money and fame and notoriety. The big stuff in the kingdom of God is that we would look at the innocence and the willingness to humble themselves of a child. And we would see that that is what God seeks in us. So the disciples, they simply didn't believe that the children were worthy of Jesus' time. In that day and time, children were viewed as valuable, by and large, for uh, pushing forward the father's reputation. The child has value if it makes the dad look good. If the child doesn't make the dad look good, the child has no value. Children were viewed as valuable for extending and advancing the boundaries of empire, but not because of what and who they were, but Jesus came into the world to change that. When you follow the train of Christian history, we see that Jesus consistently looked for the overlooked. You know the irony here is that the disciples who should have been mature were actually the ones, in a negative sense, acting like kids. If we follow the narrative, it's not far and it's not long before the disciples begin to argue about who should play quarterback. You guys remember that story? where they begin to argue about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I think I should be. No, I think that you should be. And there's a couple of these guys, and their mom actually comes into the discussion, and they, she says, basically, can't my sons be number one on your team, Jesus? I mean, imagine the humiliation that came along with that. Like you're with your friends, and all of a sudden your mom shows up, and she's like, my son should pitch. In fact, both of my sons should pitch. And you're just like, Mom, please, you're killing me, right? 
The irony is that the disciples didn't yet understand that humility should be a stepping stone rather than a stumbling block in Jesus' kingdom. So that in verses 14 and 15, we see once again that if we, should, if we love Jesus, then we should love what he loves. Amen? Children are precious to Jesus, so they should be precious to us. So when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. And this is one of the few times to where Mark notes Jesus, the gospel writer Mark says that Jesus was indignant. Now let me clear this up quickly. Um, this doesn't mean Jesus was like um, emotionally unstable. It doesn't mean that Jesus, oh, Jesus just went off. It's not talking about that. Have you ever been around people to where you're not exactly sure when the nuclear detonator is going to be hit? And you're like walking barefoot on the top of eggshells because you're not exactly sure what they're going to do, what they're going to say, how long their fuse is going to last. And you are just, I mean, absolutely a nervous wreck because you're going to have to deal with the fallout. Once they start going off, it's hard to contain. We all have been there. And um, if the person that is plays that role in your life is sitting next to you, the best thing to do would be to just keep looking forward, all right? Don't look to the right or the left. Do not give an elbow at this time. So what the, what the Bible's talking about, it's not saying that Jesus just went off or lost his temper or, or began to just uh, become irate for no reason, but Jesus had a conscious decision to say, what you guys are doing is not right. It's a righteous anger to say, you're completely subverting the gospel. What this should be about is humility before God, but you guys are saying because these kids don't bring all of what you think is important, you're pushing them to the side. I'm telling you, if we look at the humility of a child, that will give us a reference point for our heart that should be humble before God. Jesus is saying, guys, this is not right. And Jesus says in verse 15, truly I say to you, Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. That's a big deal. Kingdom of God is not like some Disney vacation. He's literally saying, if we do not in humility receive the gospel, receive Jesus, he's saying we will not be saved, we will not enter the kingdom of heaven, and basically we will continue on the highway to hell. Now, what is it about children that Jesus would point this out? Well, children reflect a properly basic trust. It's altogether rational. It's altogether proper for a child to look to, to his or her parent and, and look at them and, and, and want and desire and be humble and open and say, I want you know, more snack or I want to go to bed and be, be open. Jesus is saying that a child has that humility. Jesus is, in a sense, telling the adults, you think that these children have to become so-called or so you believe big and strong and known like you, but I'm telling you that you have to become like them. Jesus actually considered children to be worthy of his attention. Jesus regarded children. And not only that, as we saw in this verse, Jesus elevates children as the ideal citizens of the ultimate kingdom. The great evangelist and preacher D.L. Moody gave the gospel at this church a revival gathering one time, and someone said, how many people came to faith in Christ today? And he said, two and a half people. And they said, awesome. So you had two adults and one child. And he says, no, we actually had two children and one adult because the children have their lives all the way out in front of them. It's understanding the potential of a child. And again, guys, the disciples knew better because they had the Bible, they had the Hebrew scriptures, they understood what they should be about, but what happened to the disciples is what often happens to us, to where we understand what Jesus values is a broken and contrite spirit. Jesus is not looking for us to say, Jesus, look at all this stuff I've done. Done pretty well this year, right? Dab it up, right? Pound it, yeah. I mean, look at what I've done. Look at where I've been. Jesus, look at this. Jesus is not looking for that. Jesus is looking for humility in my life and in our lives, saying, Jesus, thank you for where you've brought me. Thank you for where you've brought me to. And through your power, I can do all things through you who gives me strength. Imagine how, imagine how the men in Jesus' audience felt. 
This was a day and time to where everything was steeped and saturated in Roman military conquest. And for the Jewish men, it was this hope that the Messiah would be this even stronger, even, even greater, even more violent, even more take people to the floor. And I mean, the Messiah would obviously be a military leader, right? Everything was steeped in macho, macho man. But Jesus says, in order to be strong, you have to become weak. Jesus declares to everyone present, the men, the women, that you will not enter the kingdom of heaven unless you are willing to humble yourself like a little child. So then the question to us over 2,000 years later, uh, how can I help children come to faith in Jesus Christ? Whether it's my children or those in my church or my community, number one, it's to pour the word of God into your children or your grandchildren. To look for everything that we can to pour the word of God into them. If you want your child to be a great singer, you're going to do everything that you possibly can to give them singing lessons, right? If you want them to be a great softball player or a great quarterback, you're going to look for every opportunity. And you're going to even create some opportunities to give them an opportunity to learn more about becoming that ideal. Regardless of what we want our kids to be, and for some who have teenagers, you say, Jeff, I would just like them to be out of the house. <laughs> Regardless of what we want them to be, our heart cry should be, that he becomes a man of God and she becomes a woman of God, that they love Jesus Christ and they have their relationship with him. Uh, there's a, a quick video I'd like to show you. Feel free to laugh the entirety of the video. Uh, as many of you guys know, I'm a fairly new dad. We have a two-and-a-half-year-old and an eight-month-old, and this is uh, one way that we're trying uh, as new parents to pour the word of God into our two-and-a-half-year-old. So we're, look at a quick video of me uh, reading him, um, a, we could say, an illustrated version of um, Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. Is that okay? To, uh, hopefully this will be an encouragement uh, to you. Let's direct our attention to the screens. Okay, Noah, you want to read Jericho? <gasps> oh... This is Joshua, and he, what is Joshua. he hold, What is he holding in his hand? Oh, your hand. What is that? A sword. That's a sword, and all the walls are coming down. Noah, who are these guys? No, guys. Who? A, a priests. 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 What are they blowing? A horn. Horn. Blow, go... <sighs> And it goes. <laughs> and then, Noah, what song did they sing? A Jericho. Jericho song. So go one, song. go one, one, two, three. Two, three. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. Jericho. Jericho, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and the walls came tumbling down. The walls fell down. Wow. Good job, Noah. Look at that. Guys, this is something that we try to do every night to build a spiritual heritage into and Noah's body life. Body uh, he uh. wants to now read something called a potty book. But uh, I would encourage you guys to pick up something like this. Um, I am a rare, fairly new dad. Um, mm -hmm. This is our oldest two and a half and we want to this try to book. build um, this book. truth into his uh, and do his life biblical truth. So I'd encourage you to have, um, if you have story time with your kids, just work in something like this. The stories are all illustrated. You can make sound effects. You make your own sound effects and make it as awesome as possible so that God will give them a hunger and thirst for uh, the truths that you can teach them later on. So Noah, say say bye-bye, friends. Bye, friends. Say love you. Love you. Okay. 
Say night night. Night night. So, so that's just a suggestion of something that we've tried. And uh, if you're a parent, grandparent, guardian, say, man, I, 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 I feel your pain, right? We're trying to go deep in theology in the Bible, and all of a sudden it takes a turn towards the potty book, right? Like we've all, we've all been there. But um, we actually have there in your notes, uh, in your worship guide, on the back, um, we, we did a little research here. And these are some resources for pouring the gospel into your children. We have recommended resources for toddlers, preschool, elementary, middle school, high school, and then even college and above. And I know for some of our dads and our moms, we say, man, Jeff, honestly, we didn't raise our kids um, in the church. We didn't have Jesus or the word of God as a part of our family. Now my kids are college and above, but recently, last year or so, um, I have become a follower of Christ. Um, It'd be kind of strange for me to put my 25-year-old son on my lap and lean back on the bed and read him uh, Jericho. So what do I I do um, there. Uh, I'd encourage you, this is a a special opportunity for those uh, of us who say, man, that just wasn't a part of uh, how we raised our kids, but it can be the spiritual heritage that begins today with the next step. So if you have grown children who say, hey, look, you know this is new to dad, this is new to mom, I would love to start this together. Even if you guys don't yet um, believe um, what we believe now, let's learn together. And you can take one of those college and above opportunities and begin to just learn with them together. And they will be able to see the change that Jesus has done in your life. So you're not trying to be preachy to them. You're not trying to be hypocritical to them. You are letting them know, look, that's not how I was, but today Jesus has given me a different set of desires, and I would love for us to learn together. That is the posture of humility. Amen, church? So whatever course the the Lord leads you to do, the key word here for all of us is intentionality. Intentionality, that we are intentional about pouring the word of God into our children. There are some of us um, who would likely say, because this is a very common objection, to say, well, Jeff, I want to let my kids decide for themselves. I was forced to go to church when I was a kid, and I don't want to do that to my kids. Well, we may be neutral, but Satan is not neutral, and the culture that surrounds us today is definitely not neutral. So if we choose, because of some uh, misdirected guilt of the past, to basically abdicate and give away the spiritual influence role, then somebody else is going to jump into that seat, and they're probably going to take our kids somewhere that we don't want them to go. So you say, well, Jeff, I was raised with legalistic, I mean, mean parents who said, you're going to go to church or we're going to worship Jesus and you're going to like it, right? And you still have that playing in your mind. Think about the heart desire, even if your parents didn't act right. And by the way, none of us always do. Their heart, God used maybe even sometimes their legalism to at least bring you to Jesus so you could learn about him. And you don't have to do it exactly like mom and dad did. But let's remember that Satan has declared war on us and on our children and on our community and on our neighborhoods. And may it be for us that we are intentional, even if we don't have kids, to support and to serve with those who do influence in a direct way the next generation. So point number two is to pray for God to open their hearts to the gospel. And we can read Jericho every night. We can bring them to to vacation Bible school. We can bring them to Grace Kids. But it doesn't mean that they will become genuine Christians. Now, God often uses that to to create a fertile field, a heart that is ready to receive the gospel. But there is a point that all of our kids are going to hit. And those children that we know, our nephews, our nieces, our grandchildren, it has to be them in Jesus. It has to be their faith. And if we could, we would wave some magic wand and make them love Jesus Christ, right? We understand we can bring them to water, but we can't make them drink. But we pray that God would open their heart. We, we pray and say, oh God, and all of my, my desire to pour the word of God into them, I know I've been inconsistent at times. I know there have been often times where they've seen the flaws in my life and in my heart. God, I'm praying that you would push away those flaws from me or, or their absent father and that you would help them to see Jesus. 
Help them to see Jesus. Help them to understand that mom and dad are a work in progress. Mom and dad have all sorts of issues, but help them through our broken, our often stumbling, leading them to you. Help them to see you for who you are. And we pray that God uses all of the intentional pouring the word into them to create an appetite to where they place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And my goodness, we see stories all through the Bible of children and young people that God used in a powerful way. We think about little Samuel, who became a great prophet in the Old Testament. And the Bible says that not one of his words fell to the ground. We think about King David before he was King David, a teenager taking down the greatest warrior of that time, Goliath. We think of the little drummer boy. I'm just kidding. That's not actually in the Bible. We think about all sorts of stories through the word of God, how God raised up children from good good homes and broken homes for his glory. May we look with the eyes of Jesus to see the potential that these children have, but not just future potential, the incredible, valuable little people that they are right now. So number three, let the church help. Somebody say amen. Amen. Let the church help. We have Grace Kids, Grace Students, Awana, sort of like Home Depot, you can do it, but we can help. We're the supplement, right? It's not going to work if you say, well, I'm going to just drop them off once a week and never talk about it the rest of our time together as a family. What that may show is you really don't care about what we do here. But if we can work together, if we can work together where the church supplements and encourages and bolsters what you do at home, my goodness, the emphasis that you can make on Jesus and the work that he can do through your child's life. At times I've baptized children who've given a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and their parents are there. I'll always say, uh, parents, say, you guys are and will be the greatest influence in their life. You are the greatest spiritual influence on whether or not they continue to be faithful with Jesus. And guess what? None of us can do it alone. That's why God has provided the local church to help. Let us help. Number four. This is practical. Invite the entire family to Christmas at Grace. Yeah, three services are early birds, 8.30. Y'all ready for that? Come on, you say, Jeff, amen, but my husband or wife, they're a late person, and that's the reason why we're in this service, right? Not in the 9.30 service right now. What we're going to try, this, by the way, remember, our new uh, service schedule starting on January 27th, 2019. That's where we're going to start uh, for that time all the way through Memorial Day and see where the Lord leads. But this is a great practical opportunity. Go ahead and take all of those ornaments off of those trees. We want those trees stripped bare like a plague of locusts came through. Because every, every single thing hanging on those trees in the lobby is an invitation. It's an invitation. It is? Yeah, try it. So I'd encourage you guys, the next several weeks, let's invite, invite, invite for our Christmas weekend services. I don't even know what I'm going to do on Christmas morning. Pastor Lorenzo, we're probably, you and I are probably just going to lay on the floor and just stare at the ceiling, right? Five services. Come on, right? So on Sunday, three services, 8, 30, 10, 1130, and then on Christmas Eve, candlelight services. We hope that we don't burn the place down, but uh, we have insurance. Amen. And so 5 and 7 p.m on Christmas Eve. Guys, this is a natural, this is not weird. This is not weird. This isn't like a a July 15th, hey, my pastor's talking about a word study in the middle of Leviticus, you should come, type of invitation. This is like, man, Christmas is about Jesus, family. Why don't you come to Christmas service with us? It's an easy ask. It's an easy ask. Like, well, I've never asked him before. Give it a shot. Give it a shot. And you say, man, I, I, need, to go, I need to go to church for Christmas because you, you know me. You know me. I need some church in my life, right? I go all the time, but imagine if I didn't, right? And invite them to uh, Christmas services. Five, and uh, finally, number five, and finally, give generously to the Legacy Christmas Offering for a dedicated children's ministry center. It's not about the facility, It's the ministry that the facility will facilitate. Run that by you one more time. It's not the facility, but it's the ministry that the facility will facilitate. 
And guys, to see the potential, I love y'all so much. You're so much fun to preach to and pray for me because I almost always go over time and it's your fault, all right? (laughs) But to imagine, imagine the impact that can be had within this local church If we give generously and we can build this thing, and it's not just for us, but it's for those who haven't yet heard the gospel. It's for our community. It's for our school ministry to have a dedicated children's ministry space because right now, depending on the ages of your children, you could actually have three different drop-off points. It's like the great... Bermuda Triangle trying to get there and and come here early. Right? Some of you, you you guys, right? You feel the pain, right? This is where we are currently, but boy, this would just make things so much better to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not about building buildings, and guess what? That's building buildings, my goodness. That's a hard thing, especially in Palm Beach County. But if it's what can be used for the glory of Jesus Christ to reach people with the gospel, bring it on. Bring it on. Every single building that's been constructed on this property has been used in a powerful way in this gospel outpost. This is a current need. We have a lot of children, as you can hear this morning, right? And in our nursery, in our our cry room, our cry room often is is a pretty crowded place. We have a lot of children and, and grace kids. So this would incredibly enhance the ministry here at Grace to reach people for Jesus Christ. A week before Thanksgiving, Jen and the boys uh, went up to the Carolinas a few days before. And uh, if you have ever lived life with a two and a half year old and an eight month old, there's a part of your mind that says, I may get a little bit of rest. And uh, it was awesome for about 30 minutes. And uh, then I began to just, I don't know, man, I began to feel lonely, and it was strange. I kept calling my wife, how are y'all doing? She's like, we're, we're doing well. We were doing well an hour ago when you called last, you know, and, you know, we're fine. How are you? I'm like, but it was just, it was strange. It was strange because I saw kid toys and bottles and things that say the next generation should be there, and it was strange when they weren't. You know what a lot of churches in the U.S. are experiencing? That same feeling, but it's in their church. Saying, wow, the, where did the next generation go? They should be here, and this feels strange, and it should. But praise be to Jesus Christ. He is giving us an opportunity to build into the next generation for his glory. May this be our commitment. This is there in your notes and on the screen to the next generation. Psalm 78 verse 4, we will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. That'll preach right there. To tell the future coming generations of what God has done and pray that he will work within that generation to reach their future generations.